You're watching HuffPost Live, I'm Ricky Camilleri. Since August, the video game industry has been embroiled in an internal debate and scandal that is currently boiling over into the mainstream. If you're on one side of the scandal, hashtag Gamergate is a grassroots movement attempting to promote and push for ethical journalism in the gaming industry. If you're on the other side of the controversy, hashtag Gamergate's push for journalistic standards is a thin veil masking a male-dominated industry's misogynist tendencies and childish temper tantrums, leading to threats and harassment of female gamers. Either way, on both sides, people have been threatened and apparently lost their jobs for voicing their opinion. Now, since this is a somewhat insidery subject to follow if you're not involved in video games or even message boards, we're going to go back to the beginning. Joining us to share her story is game developer Brianna Wu, who has been the victim of harassment. Hello, Brianna. Hey, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, one quick note before we get started talking to uh, Brianna. If you've been following Gamergate today on Twitter, you will have noticed that we did invite Zoe Quinn on. Zoe is at the center of hashtag Gamergate controversy and has been a victim of harassment as a result. She decided not to join us, and that is totally fine. That is not a reason to harass her, and guess what? There is never a good reason to harass anyone. The point of this discussion is to not is to have an objective debate about harassment and online bullying because there's no objectivity to be had there. It's wrong. Can I, can I say something Don't about that? Don't harass okay. anyone. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Go go ahead, Brianna. Well, I was just going to say Zoe is my friend, and as terrible as the last three days have been for me, um, it's been much worse for Zoe. I haven't had my whole sex life dragged through the mud. You know, um, this has been going on for her for months. So I would really encourage anyone out there that has basic compassion for another human being to give, give her some space. Like she's barely holding on. Said it better than I could have with the prompter that yeah. I was reading. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I no, no, not, not, no, no apologies necessary. Brianna, let's go back and start with how this all started for you. When did you start receiving her harassment and what were the supposed reasons for the harassment that you were receiving? You know, isn't it funny how when these things blow up, it's over something that's so incredibly minor and ridiculous that when you, you look back at it, it's it's almost kind of funny. Um, I have a show on 5x5, Five Five, which is one of the most popular tech podcast um, networks in the entire world. My show is called Isometric. I had a fan that made a few Gamergate tweets, uh, a few Gamergate memes based on my tweets and sent them to me. And I thought it was funny. I laughed. Um, I tweeted them. And then Achan, which is you know the site I and many other people in the video game industry consider a hate site, um, they didn't like being made fun of in a very gentle manner, I might say. Um, so they then spent all day Thursday attacking me, making memes to make fun of me, to threaten me, to belittle me, um, and to basically belittle women uh, that are the targets and the victims of Gamergate. Um, you know, from there, I took a Twitter break because I was genuinely fearful for my safety. So I walked away. I spent about 24 hours off Twitter. I talked to friends and I'm like, you know what? These bullies are not going to bully me out of the video game industry. I am going to stand strong for women here. And, you know, I said that in no uncertain terms on my Twitter. And, you know, a friend of mine was watching 8chan and they told me that 8chan was currently blowing up discussing me. So they started investigating my life. They started investigating my husband's life. They started digging up my company, looking for dirt. And I'm sitting there watching this chat room, um, not chat room, 8chan's message board spin out of control going after me and my husband. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is Friday night. And, you know, 8chan is not, you know, it's a hate group. So imagine how you'd feel if you saw a hate group kind of starting to investigate your life. I mean, it was, well, it was Brianna, let's, uh, Brianna, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Let's backtrack yeah. just for a minute. Uh, of course. We, we are going to have Frederick Brennan, who is an administrator at Hate 8chan, on in just a little bit. But I want to go back to what exactly 8chan is to you. You keep referring to it as a hate group. As, as yes. I know it, it, it was something that was started after certain people were barred from 4chan, 4chan an, a, a, mm -hmm. an old school message board site. <laughs> that is uh, used pretty regularly. I am not a user of these, so I'm, I'm, I'm you know, my lingo is off, if you'll excuse <laughs> me. But uh, and why is it referred to as a hate group? Is it all hate that is being posted on 8chan? Do you, in your opinion, think it was made solely to be able to express hate after these people were thrown off of 4chan? 
So, you know, 4chan is well known in the media. I'm, I think it's safe to say that 4chan does not have a sterling reputation to begin with. Um, 4chan had kind of stoked the flames of Gamergate for months and months and months and months uh, to the point where, as I understand it, because I also don't visit these sites because I'm a respectable person, um, you know, 4chan basically game, uh, banned the subject of Gamergate. I don't know if it was because they were worried they were starting to open themselves up to civil liability. Um, I think they could tell that people's lives were starting to be threatened. Um, so basically, 8chan or Infinite Chan came along and gave these people a home to voice, you know, these opinions that were too extreme for 4chan. Like, think about that. These opinions were too much out there for 4chan. Like, the only thing, other thing I'm aware that 4chan bans is child pornography. So that's 8chan for you. But don't take my word for it. Go to the site. Look at what they say about me, about women. You know, look at the people that are using the site. I mean, make up your own mind about it. Don't take my word for it. Absolutely. I want to bring in our other two guests right now. Uh, it's Frederick Brennan, who is an administrator at 8chan, as well as Eric Kane, a contributor with Forbes. Uh, Eric, I want, to, I want to start with you. Frederick, obviously, we're going to give you a chance to defend yourself after, uh, after hearing that. And we're going to open this up for a conversation between um, the three of you here. I'm hoping it, that we can keep it uh, pretty pretty civil. Everybody has agreed to that. Uh, based off of my Twitter feed this morning and early this afternoon, it doesn't seem like it's going to be that civil, but I'm hoping that you guys, you guys can handle yourselves pretty well. Eric, I want to go back to August. I want to hear exactly how this started because we've mentioned uh, Zoe Quinn. We've talked a little bit about Brianna. We've talked a little bit about 8chan, but we've sort of talked about it in this roundabout way without giving the exact facts. Can you give me a brief rundown as to how Gamergate began and how we got to where we are today? Um... You know, honestly, I think that this is a pretty complicated issue, and it goes back a lot further than than August. Um, I would say that that Gamergate is is the result of kind of years of dissatisfaction um, amongst uh, video game uh, consumers, uh, with the video game press, with what's with some of the politics that that. Uh, that the video game press sort of generally ho holds to, and with perceptions of um, journalists and industry being too cozy. I mean, I think it's a lot of different things, and I think that what happened with the Zoe Quinn scandal, and um, and then following that, some articles posted about sort of uh, gamers being over. I think what what we saw was sort of a boiling over point that came after a, a, a much longer period of sort of hostility and alienation between. Um, readers at, at a lot of these websites and journalists at these websites. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's just a straightforward um, one thing or another that led to this. I think it's, I think it's a sort of a momentum that sort of, sort of boiled over. And uh, I but, think that certainly what happened with Zoe Quinn was, was part of that. I think what happened when uh, Leigh Alexander and a number of other writers wrote Gamers Are Over Pieces was part of that. And I think that it's, and I think that because of the nature of sort of Gamergate as a Twitter hashtag, what we're looking at is 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 not necessarily a group or or a movement even, but a sort of uh, a, a a sort of wildfire sentiment that's that's been just waiting to happen for years. If you but Eric, know. Eric, would you agree that that wildfire sentiment also has to do with misogyny and sexism a lot at times? Um, I think there's misogynists and sexists in just about every industry, um, and I think that they're unfairly pointed at in video games. Okay. So I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I, I think that obviously, yes, there are misogynists in video games. Uh, and there are going to be misogynists, especially in, in places where anonymity is, is sort of sacrosanct. And but I think that what, what you see here is, is you see it everywhere. You see it in sports. You see it in every other industry as well. So, so while there is some of that, I think it's really hard to, to say that that is what defines what's going on. Now I want to bring Frederick in here because A-Chan allows anonymity and uh, that's where a lot of people are saying the death threats and the hate is coming from. Even just by having Frederick on today, I received tweets that said, with all due respect, by signal boosting a group sending women death threats, you're already putting them in a compromise compromising place. I also received, this is gross, dude. You don't give a hate group a platform to spread hate. There isn't a truth to offer. I received, hi, I'm Ricky Cam. Today we have a young black man who was beaten by KKK members. And to be fair to both sides, we also have the KKK members. So Frederick, you and 8chan are being referred to or likened to the KKK in terms of being a hate group. How do you answer to that? 
first, I think it's pretty funny that you keep calling it hate chan. Um, no, no, I no. I said, I said, I said, I said, chan. I didn't say hate chan. <laughs> it's all right. Anyway, I would like to counter a couple things that Miss Wu said. First of all, hate chan was not founded for Gamergate. Hate chan was founded in October of 2013. It was basically an idea I had as an alternative to 4chan. Um, someone made a Gamergate board on 8chan, but it was not founded for the purpose of Gamergate, and it will be around long after Gamergate is over. Um, uh, another thing that I really wanted to say is that you cannot go after 8chan for causing any kind of harassment any more than you can go after Twitter for causing any kind of harassment. I don't see anyone blaming the CEO of Twitter. You need to blame the individual users who are posting. Nobody blames AT&T when people place a threatening phone call. No one blames Google when people place a threatening email. You need to be blaming the individual users. HN is well within the confines of the law. Um, and as far as any threats go, the ones that were reported to me, I did not see any posted on HN. The only ones that were posted were on Twitter. And we have no proof that they are even the same user. I would you say have to, to let Wu. me respond to this. This is this is ridiculous. You've got yeah, to Brianna. Me. Brianna, I, I, I want to yeah. let you respond in just a second. Just let okay. just let Eric finish. He's almost done. And Brianna, I'm going to come right okay. to you. Thank you. All right. I would also say to Miss Wu that if she was really so scared, she would have went to the police instead of tweeting. That's all. Okay. Let's go. Let's go right to to Brianna. Go ahead, Brianna. Let's go through this one more time. You know, I need to tell you before I was a software developer, I was a journalist. And one of the most important classes I took um, you know, in college for journalism was communication law. And I think Frederick is delightfully oblivious to both the legal environment that he's exposing himself to. He chooses, he made a choice. In fact, he tweeted and bragged about this, about making a choice to not keep IP records because there's no law that requires him to keep IP records of people that use his site. So he has made a choice that makes it impossible or very difficult for the police to hunt down these people. So let's not pretend like he's an innocent bystander here. In fact, he's opening himself up to massive civil liability because I can't go after the people that are saying these things to me on his site, or at least it's very difficult. He makes it very difficult to do so. So he's not understanding that he opens himself up to a massive amount of civil liability for defamation and these other things. Huffington Post can't run if Huffington Post ran on the front page an article about the things that 4chan is saying about me, you have claims, not opinion, claims that they're making, you guys would be opening yourselves up to a huge lawsuit. And as it is right now, all of that liability is now on Frederick's shoulders. And, you know, I encourage anyone out there that is targeted by these people to, you know, these laws that protect people's reputations, they exist for a reason. These liability laws exist for a reason. Um, I also want to say, you know, there's been a lot of his users that are attacking me, attacking the victim of a crime. And I think it's absolutely disgusting. You know, I had the police at my house and believe it or not, I was sitting there talking to the police and they finished. And then I'm sitting there crying after the policeman is sitting there looking at the death threat sent to me and shaking his head. And like, as I was getting ready to leave the house, I tweeted them out and I was frustrated and there's no perfect way to be a victim. But I personally do not appreciate them turning this around on me. The actions of his site have driven me from my home. And I have to say one more thing here, a bald faced lie that HN users and Frederick just repeated on your show, a bald faced complete lie is that his users had nothing to do with this. I want to repeat this timeline one more time because I want to be very clear. Thursday, A-Chan went after me all day long to the point I was scared. I told my Twitter followers I was scared and I went away for 24 hours. I talked to friends. I got the guts to say, I'm going to stay in the video game industry. I'm not going to be bullied by these people. And A-Chan users went after me like a mob of crazy, insane people. And you can go to that board and you can watch what they were saying about me. Then after that, there was this post that came down and someone says, whoops, did I do that? And they posted my phone number and my address. 
and all this stuff. And within moments, 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 I received that horrible, horrible list of death threats that you probably cannot even show on your show. Mm -hmm. So it is a bald faced lie that they are not responsible for this. Frederick, obviously in creating 8chan and, and promoting it and working there, you are you are talking about free speech, you care very much about free speech, but I'm curious when it comes, you use AT&T as a, as a reference point, if there was making threats via AT&T phone lines, if there was someone who was seen as a threat, authorities could go to AT&T, they could get phone records. That's how this works. Where do you stand on someone going to you as an administrator and saying, we need to find out who this user is, they are making threats. They are doxing people, they are giving out addresses, they are giving out phone numbers, they are promoting threatening someone. So at that point, when you essentially become the conduit for people, are threatening, are making legitimate threats, where do you stand then? Um, all right, well, so far as I know, uh, I would also like to go back and point out something that Ms. Wu said. Well, ju uh, well just answer the, that question yeah. that I just asked you, though. All right, fine. Um, where I stand on the record issue, we have no data retention requirement under the law. Therefore, we don't retain any data. Uh, we could change the system so that it retains data. Unfortunately, we were just not able to. 8chan is open source software. You can go on my GitHub account, that's control C, control V slash 8chan. You can look at the source and verify for yourself. As soon as a post is deleted, it calls an immediate deletion to the SQL server and then removes any related media file. We could change it, it's just the system is not so designed right now. And because we have no legal requirement to design it that way, it's not a top priority. Okay. So now, what, would, what did you want to go back and respond to? Uh, as far as her saying that we are required to um, moderate every single post on the site, uh, that is complete nonsense. She should look at um, the Communications Decency Act, Section 320, which protects the right of website owners um and the users on the site so um i don't have the exact snippet in front of me right now but basically it says that website administrators are not responsible for the content that their users post that's why things like facebook gmail everything we enjoy on the internet today can exist mm -hmm. that, is, that is an insane statement look at the history of google in youtube um before google was going to open themselves up and allow people um youtube rather before it was owned by they had to spend an immense amount of time figuring out the jurisprudence for you know the digital millennial, millennial copyright act because they knew they were opening themselves up to liability and i think your understanding of the law here is is laughable and I would personally, with yeah. nothing to do with HN, I would strongly suggest you find a lawyer and find out what you're opening yourself up to. Because Brianna, you may have the principle that you're not held to these standards, but the law is different. Brianna, I wanna, I wanna open this yes. conversation up really fast. Uh, and I wanna ask you a question. It's a bit of a devil's advocate question, um, yes. which is that you know, if you weren't, and you shouldn't have to take yourself out of this situation, but if you weren't right. being harassed in the way that you are. I'm curious if you would have the opinion that there is a journalistic ethics problem in the gaming industry. If so much of it didn't already have to do with sexism right now, if so much of it didn't have to do with threats and harassment, if in any way you think there is an, uh, a journalistic ethics problem in the gaming industry or this is just a thin veil to be able to harass, manipulate, and intimidate women. I want to be very clear here. Um, myself and my co-host on Isometric, uh, which is a tech podcast, Maddie Myers, we have been talking about the issues that Gamergate is ostensibly about for years. And the pretext of Gamergate that's about ethics is something I agree with. Of course, I agree that journalistic game journalists should have a code of conduct and adhere to it. That's actually why almost all sites out there have that already. But you know, when I write some code, it doesn't matter what I hope the code will be. I evaluate the code by what the outcome is. When I run it through my compiler and I see what the result is. The result of Gamergate is HN users are systematically targeting and destroying the personal reputations of women in the industry. Please let me give you a list of them. My friend, Samantha Allen, was bullied out of the game industry by these people. Um, Brianna, Jen Frank Brianna. was bullied out of the industry by these people. 
Maddie Bryce was bullied out of the industry by these people. Anita Sarkeesian has been targeted by these people. Lee Alexander has been targeted by these people, and I'm next. It's one after the other. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to look at the reality of the situation and own up to it. Eric, looking at the reality of the situation and owning up to it, is it possible to even discuss journalistic ethics in gaming right now? Because it seems that there are some people who want to have that conversation, but they are being drowned out by those who are more engaged in threatening and disbelieving people like Zoe Quinn and people like Brianna, threatening them and calling them liars. I mean, it, it happened today. I watched it happen on Twitter today. For whatever reason, right away, they wanted to call Zoe Quinn a liar because she wasn't going to be joining the segment. It was completely ridiculous, and it was obviously harassment. But then once they did that, they then said, you don't want to have the real debate about ethics and journalism. So I don't think people really know where to fall here. How can we clear up this conversation so something that is a bit more moderate can take place? Um, that's uh, the $64,000 question, honestly. I think that both, I think that there's just, at this point, I, I, it's almost discouraging. There's, there's so much animosity in every direction that uh, having a reasonable conversation is a huge obstacle. <laughs> Um, there, there is a lot of anger. Uh, you see it on Twitter. Twitter is one of the worst places to have a conversation at all. Uh, 140 characters or less inevitably turns into a lot of blame and, and shouting. And um, you know, I still sort of hold out hope that that through all of this we can we can find common ground. Um, maybe because I'm naive, or maybe because I'm an optimist. Uh, I, I think that. You know, I think that there are, like, like I said, this this whole thing goes back so long. Um, there there is there is a problem with harassment uh, of free. There is a problem with perceptions of of game journalists being in bed with industry. There is a problem with with this sort of just weird hostility between writers and readers. And 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 I guess from the beginning of this, I've always hoped that that somehow maybe it would spark a dialogue. But what I see more and more is that I think the loudest voices are prevailing and that dialogue is, is becoming increasingly difficult Hostile. to have. Increasingly. Hey, excuse I mean, me. Please Brianna, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. Brianna, we do, we, 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 we do have to wrap up. Um, before that we do wrap up, I want to say one thing to Frederick and Brianna. The both of you are incredibly brave for joining this debate, having this conversation with each other. I think it says so much about your intentions and about your objective within this controversy. To my join intentions this panel are to get a chan off my neck and the other necks of other women in the industry. Absolutely. We can have a conversation about this stuff after yeah. you stop terrorizing us. And we will continue. We will continue having this conversation here at HuffPost Live. Um, Frederick, Eric, Lee. Brianna, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a believe it or not, Brianna. HN is not all about you. All right, guys. Let's uh, <laughs> let's. I don't want to leave it there. I don't want to leave it there, Frederick. It was kind of unnecessary to to do that, Brianna. I apologize for those last comments. Well, Keep watching HuffPost Live. We got a lot more coming up next.